Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our virtual three for three pop up fair. Uh, as you many of you know, we do these every semester. However, generally it's virtual and we have different uh, organizations, both from the university as well as off campus, uh, joining us to provide information about resources and uh, other kinds of things for not only our students, but certainly faculty who may be in need of some of the resources that we generally don't think about. And so today I am very happy that we're doing this particular form uh, virtually and uh, we are um, have with us today uh, Jenny Fay, who is with the Cupcake Cake Girls here in Las Vegas, and she will be interviewed for, by uh, Margaret Camp, who is new to UNLV. She is the, the new uh, director of the UNLV Women's Center, and so I'm really, really excited to have this opportunity for them to have a conversation and to talk about the Cupcake Girls and, and the resources that they provide for a, a very important population for individuals who uh, may find themselves in the sex industry and are in need of resources to make sure that their lives are whole. So without further ado, I am going to uh, turn this over to Margaret and we can go from there. I believe that we're gonna have brief intro introductions from each of our panelists as uh, and about who they are as well as their services and then We'll go on from there. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Barlow. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Margaret Campy, and I am, as uh, Dr. Barlow noted, the director of the Gene Nedich Women's Center. So the Gene Nedich Women's Center serves UNLV students, faculty, and staff who have been impacted by sexual assault, sexual harassment, relationship abuse, um, family violence, and or stalking. And the center operates from an anti-oppression framework to provide trauma-informed and healing-centered care. I'm here today by invitation of the Intersection, which is the Multicultural Resource Center. The Intersection is a one-stop resource for UNLV's diverse student body, and it's a comprehensive multicultural center that's grounded in the academic life of our students. So the Intersection helps students, particularly first-generation students and students of color, successfully navigate their academic careers. And as Dr. Barlow mentioned, the Intersection hosts many pop-up resource fairs like this one I'm hosting today to help connect UNLV students with community and campus resources. So first, I wanna thank Dr. Barlow, the Executive Director of the Intersection for inviting me here to host uh, this discussion with Jenny Fay, who is the Executive Director of Cupcake Girls with community resource today. Um, and so then without, without um, any further explanation, I'd like to introduce Jenny Fay. Jenny, could you tell us a little bit more about the history of Cupcake Girls, the mission and the services that the agency provides? Absolutely. So the Cupcake Girls is a non-religious, non-political nonprofit. We've been officially around for about nine and a half years, but our story actually starts before then. Um, all the way back in 2009, at the very end of 2009, Joy Hoover, and her husband, Phil, um, they're from Michigan and they came to Vegas on a trip. But as they looked around, they they really saw there's um, very much a thriving adult entertainment industry here, but also it seems like there's a lot of stigma and lack of resources surrounding the adult industry. Um, so there seems like, uh, you know, that folks working in that industry are very much pushed to the margins or may not have access to things that they need. So they went home because that's what happens when you go on trips. Um, so they went home, but Joyce said they just couldn't shake that. They are activist people with big hearts and wanted to be able to do something um, to link arms with folks. So early 2010, they moved to Vegas and then started kind of unofficially um, connecting with folks in the adult industry, taking cupcakes to strip clubs and legal brothels. And then about a year in after hearing stories of needs, stories of how people would like for those needs to be met, it became evident we need an official organization to be able to serve people better. And so that's when we filed as a 501c3 
we Joy talks about how she kind of deliberated about what to call the organization, but then remembered, oh, well, every time we show up at the clubs or brothels with our cupcakes, the workers always say, our cupcake girls are here. And so we realized we already have a name. Our clients have already named us. We're the cupcake girls. And we provide aftercare to sex trafficking survivors and non-judgmental support to folks in the adult industry. Really, our goal is to be able to empower our clients in their pursuits. So um, we're not a rescue organization. We are a resources organization. And we're not here to say, oh, here's what you should do. And here's how you should do it. Instead, we're here to listen well and use an empowerment model that hears from our clients about what they're wanting, what, what they're wanting their life to look like, and then offering tools and resources and helping them figure out the steps to get where they want to go, whatever that may be. Great, thank you for that robust um, introduction. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, a lot of info. it was it was very, very informative. So w another question that I have is how has you know, we're, we're in very interesting times right now. Um, so how has COVID-19 impacted sex workers? And and I also want to know, you know, piggybacking on that. Are there any changes to the services that Cupcake Girls provides that would be helpful for folks to know about given the pandemic? Absolutely. So we, I mean, in Vegas, most people are pretty aware, um, strip clubs, legal brothels, most things are shut down right now. So that means then that our clients who are currently working in the adult industry are really struggling financially. Um, a lot are applying for unemployment, but from what we're hearing from our clients and even just other people in our lives, it can take a long time to get unemployment. And so finances are tight. Um, we've also seen, like, I, I just pulled some numbers of 2019, like March through August, and then 2020, March through August, and just kind of looked at, you know, needs and things that we were seeing in our organization. And we saw that those months this year, we had an increase of 150% at our branch of support requests coming in. So people reaching out who needed support. And then we saw, um, cause we track like, you know, how our communication with clients, emails, phone calls, meetings, and we had a 600% increase from those months in 2019 to those months in 2020 of our communications with clients, which tells us we're not only seeing more clients reaching out, we're seeing more clients with higher needs um, needing to be able to get more support um, even than during regular times. And so, um, you know, one of the things that that we have provided through these past few months is uh, we have an option for clients to apply for rental assistance because we know that's a big need. Uh, we have made sure to uh, make our connections with food pantries and other food distribution options even more robust because Food insecurity is a real thing right now for many of our clients, but we also know that while it feels like kind of the world stopped for a little bit, our lives don't stop and our minds don't stop. And so we're seeing a lot of our clients um, wanting mental health resources, but also being uncertain about, well, how do you do that? Or how do our clients do that if maybe they don't feel safe going out and about? So we have way more virtual options for that. Um, partners who do counseling, we actually provide a little bit of counseling in-house as well. So looking to at just whether it's mental health resources or other resources, what are some options for virtual options? That's definitely, I mean, here we are on video doing virtual. That's something that is a need and it's important to us to be able to offer that uh, so folks can access that. Absolutely. Thank you. It sounds like, you know, it sounds like your organization really has, you know, responded and lock and step with um, the current situation and, and, you know, pivoted accordingly, um, just like many organizations have had to, like you said, we're, we're here, we're virtual today, um, as most things are these days. So, so thank you for that explanation. Um, and those I wanna, can I, sorry, can I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, so when in March, when kind of like everything erupted and nobody really knew what, what was happening or what was going to happen, we did go virtual fully for a couple of months. Um, so we offered virtual support groups, virtual mentor and advocacy meetings and all of that. However, we also realized though that 
um, we're seeing an increase in clients disclosing um, experiencing or having experienced hidden violence. So as soon as the quarantine orders were lifted, it was really important to us to be able to open up in person. So we actually are open in person. We're available for clients to meet in person as well as available for virtual because we know that some folks um, over the phone or over video, they can't actually share fully what their situation is or what their needs are. And we want to create a safe and inclusive space where that can happen. So that's available now as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that clarification. I appreciate that. Um, those those numbers, those increases that you've seen um, comparatively over 2020 and 2019 are, um, you know, almost just jaw dropping, right? To see how, you know, we know the pandemic is affecting everybody, right? But but to see this sort of disproportionate effect that it seems to be having on the population that you serve is is um, a sobering, to be honest. Um, so I so I also wanted to ask you though, um, sex work is is an industry that's prone to stigma, right, and myths. You talked about that uh, when you introduced the you know the founders of Cupcake Girls and how how this whole organization evolved. So I'm wondering if you could talk some about um, the common perceptions, stigma, and then what can we do to combat these myths and the stigma. Stigma is real, like you said, and and we see it um, permeating so many um, parts of our world. And uh, so we need to be mindful of that, whether it's stigma or myths or maybe both together. Um, there is misinformation about the adult industry floating around out there. And a, a few of the things that I want to address today would be one, there's a myth that everyone who works in the adult industry makes um, lots of money and has all that they need. And while that may be true for some folks who work in the adult industry, it's not true for everyone. Uh, the majority of our clients are moderate to low income. And honestly, with COVID, uh, we're seeing many clients who are at poverty level or below. So financially, we can't make assumptions about where people are. Um, there's also a myth actually a couple of different myths. There's a myth that anybody who's working in the adult industry, it must not be their choice. They must be forced, it must be the only option that they have. Or conversely, there's an assumption that everybody working in the adult industry, that's exactly where they wanna be and they've decided that. And what we've seen with our clients is there's a whole spectrum of perspective of people of their work uh, current or past in the adult industry. And we see folks who are in the adult industry consensually doing consensual sex work. They want to be doing this work. They're in control of when and how and in control of the money that they make doing it. We also see clients who are doing what we call survival sex work of maybe they don't feel comfortable doing the work that they're doing, but they feel like it's the only option that they have to provide for themselves and often for their families. And then we see clients who are sex trafficking survivors who they didn't choose this work. They don't have a choice in it. They're not in control of their wages. At the Cupcake Girls, the way that we define sex trafficking is anyone who's in the adult industry under coercion, deception, manipulation, or threat, and they're not in control of their wages. So there's kind of this force piece and then the financial piece um, coming together to create a trafficking situation. So we see those three main perspectives and everything in between. And we see too that sometimes people's perspectives change based on their current experience. So, you know, we had one client who she was a dancer, a consensual sex worker, wanted to be a dancer, and then met this boyfriend who seemed really nice. And she talked about how one day he busts in um, to the bathroom where she is like after shift and asks her how much she made. And she kind of popped off to him at first and told him it wasn't any of his business. And then he got really aggressive and basically let her know in no uncertain terms that from then on, she would be giving every penny to him. And suddenly her perspective shifted because now it doesn't matter whether or not she wants to work this job tomorrow. And she's no longer in control of the money that she's making. And that shifted her perspective into a sex trafficking survivor perspective. We also, though, had a client who is a sex trafficking survivor. She was trafficked for multiple years and eventually, after like five months of careful planning, was able to escape 
And she went and worked in the legal brothels, get her feet underneath her, get her finances in order, and her perspective shifted. So one of the things that I think is important to recognize is not to make assumptions about people, not to make assumptions about um, their um, their perspective of their time in the industry, um, past or present, not to make assumptions one day to the next, because again, a lot can change in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year for people. Um, and then, like I said earlier, not to make assumptions about what someone's needs may or may not be. We've also seen clients who consensual sex workers making good money. I remember talking to a woman and she said, I can afford to go see a doctor. I think I just would love to see a doctor where after the nurses leave the room, I don't hear them laughing about me in the hallway. That's stigma. We're, we're looking for like showing basic dignity and respect to all people. Um, and so that that's important just for us to realize that, that happens. And maybe when we think about our experience at the doctor's office, that might not have ever happened to us. And it's not OK that it is happening to others. And so some of the things that we can do to start breaking down the stigma that's really impacting our clients and creating a lot of additional barriers for them that I could tell story after story about, but we don't have time for. Some of the things, though, that we can do is be mindful of the words that we're using. Even the word sex worker. Let's use that word rather than a lot of other words or slang words that you may have heard. A lot of those other slang words um, that, that you have heard can be really demeaning, can really hurt someone's feelings, and can communicate you have stigma against those working in the adult industry and can communicate you're not a safe person. So we think about, um, you know, sometimes we've had clients who are sex trafficking survivors who went to the emergency room and wanted to be able to share there that they were in a situation they didn't want to be in and they needed help. When a healthcare professional can use a term like sex worker, it opens the door for that potential client to go, maybe you're safe enough for me to tell you about what's really going on. Or even just in everyday conversation, Perhaps you're talking with a consensual sex worker and you didn't even know that was their job or a part of their life. And when you say the word sex worker, you communicate, I'm safe. Um, I, I'm not trying to perpetuate stigma. And the more that we do that and the more that we ask other people in our lives to do that, even just switching out that one word could really make a big difference uh, for our clients and for our community. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jenny. Um, that was such a good explanation of the complexity of agency within sex work. And, you know, that agency is fluid, that it changes, mm -hmm. that we cannot make assumptions about people's agency. And I think, um, you know, in, in particular, that that's just such an important piece to recognize. So thank you so much for elabor elaborating on that. Um, mm -hmm. And doing so in such a, you know, coherent way was in such a small amount of time. It's a very complex topic. So I, yes. I, so, I yes. so appreciate um, your explanation of that. Um, I want to I, I want to shift gears a little bit um, to UNLV students, right? Yes. Well, yes. We definitely may have we definitely have students, you know, that have been involved in sex work or are yes. sex workers. But we also have students that are in um, a number of different majors here at UNLV that either require internships um, or where internships or volunteer opportunities might set them up for greater professional success. Um, and so I'm wondering, does Cupcake Girls have opportunities like that for students? Um, and if so, how would students get in contact with you all or, or let you know that they're interested in getting involved? Yes, I'm so glad that you asked about this. Um, Thinking about the first part of your question, just mentioning, hey, there probably are folks at UNLV who are working or have worked in the sex industry. So our services are open to any individual who is currently working or has ever worked in the sex industry in any capacity, whether it was their choice or someone else's. Um, any gender expression, gender identity, sexual orientation, any of that, we've got services. Um, it happens that the majority of our clients identify as female, so you'll hear us talk about women empowering women, but it's not to exclude anyone. It's just to kind of elevate a population that hasn't always been elevated. Um, and then for the students looking to volunteer, looking for internship opportunities, we have so many ways that people can be involved. 
On the volunteer front, we have volunteer opportunities that work directly with our clients and volunteer opportunities that work more behind the scenes. So um, the advocates who meet with our clients, they're volunteers. They meet one on one with clients. They have extensive training through us, but also the volunteers who bake the cupcakes that we take into um, strip clubs and legal brothels for outreach when it's not COVID. Uh, it's a volunteer team that does that. There's also, you know, a volunteer team that goes into the community and goes to networking events and helps us connect with potential partners, maybe doctors, attorneys, dentists, counselors who might want to offer their services to our clients. So, like I said, so many ways that folks can get involved. I really feel like if people have a passion for what we're doing, then chances are there's a way that they can contribute in a way that's really meaningful to them, but also super helpful for our clients and our organization. And then on the internship front, we offer volunteer internships anywhere from five hours a week to 20 hours a week, depending on what your school requires. Our internships last a full calendar year that really helps someone get all of the experiences underneath their belt, helps them typically experience some sort of client event with us, helps them experience a lot of meeting one on one with clients. Something that's very important to us and we've received really good feedback about is that our internships are hands on. So we've had times where um, interns with the Cupcake Girls will be sitting in class and hearing other people's experiences and going, oh, I feel like I'm I'm getting to talk with people. I'm getting the experience that I need to put on their resume. But even when they get into their career field to feel like they actually know what they're doing. Um, we provide opportunities for our interns to even be on call with the cupcake phone. You, a lot of different things in the helping world, different careers in the helping world require on call times. And I know for myself, when I when I first got into being on call, it was really terrifying. And then the more that I did it, the more I realized, okay, I know what to do. I know how to handle this. And that's what we want to set our interns up with is those experiences that might be a little bit scary at first, but they're experiencing it in, in a way that has a safety net. They've always got somebody that they can ask. And then when they get their feet underneath them, they're rocking and rolling on their own. And like I said, able to put it on their resume and able to feel ready and equipped when the time comes to get into their career field. The way that people access all of that, um, for volunteers, it's on our website. There's a tab that says get involved. And then under that tab, you can click on the volunteer application. And when somebody fills that out, we'll get in touch with them, let them know about our background check or volunteer orientation. For folks who are looking to do an internship, the best next step is to send an email to info at thecupcakegirls.org. And they can tell their name, the school where they are, and kind of what they're looking for. That'll get to the right person on our team. And then we'll reach out and be able to coordinate more. There is a process, there's an interview process. It's important to us to make sure that we're bringing people onto our team that are the right fit, that are committed, ready to work hard, because um, our clients' lives are often at stake. Um, but we're excited for more and more people to join our team. Awesome. It sounds like you have a lot of different opportunities. Um, so, so that's a, gr that's a great, um, resource for our students as well. Um, and I'm excited to, you know, spread the word about that. I know that, that folks, um, are often looking for internships. I'm wondering if you could just elaborate on one thing are are the opportunities are still there despite COVID. is that right correct correct and we have opportunity um, for folks to be more in person or um, some virtual options as well um, especially like when it comes to meeting with our clients there are some clients that for their safety and privacy need to meet in person and there are some clients that for their safety and health they need to meet virtually so we have a lot of options around that as well Okay, great. Um, I guess I, I just kind of want to conclude with if there's anything else you'd like to let UNLV students um, and the larger community know about Cupcake Girls or the sex industry more broadly. Mm -hmm. So I think um, in terms of just the sex industry in general, really circling back to the stigma piece of if we can all just start using the verbiage of sex worker rather than what other slang term um, we may have heard in the past, it can be really impactful. 
Um, I also want the larger community to recognize that the Cupcake Girls has a lot to offer for them if they are or have worked in the sex industry as far as support and services. But our three main drivers to be able to provide support to our clients are our volunteers who donate their time, our donors who donate their money, uh, one-time gifts or monthly givers, and our partners who are individuals, businesses, or organizations that align with our values and offer their services usually for free or low cost for our clients. And so we're always looking for folks to um, become one or more of those and join in with our organization. I, I love the fact that our organization has over 100 volunteers, very few staff. Um, we're pretty small staff, but we have such a robust network of volunteers and partners and donors that we show up well for our clients but it's also it's a great just community to be a part of within the cupcake girls we have core values that we abide by the first being we love without agenda and it really is beautiful um to see myself and our team members to see us land within this community um, and really thrive and grow and i'm excited for other people to be a part of that Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, I don't have any further questions for you, but I really encourage folks. I know that we're in financially stressed times right now, but certainly this organization is a worthy one. Um, and so if donating is in your purview, donating, excuse me, is in your purview, I encourage you to do that, but also to get involved, to learn more about the Cupcake Girls. Um, and and lend your support. That would be great. Thank you both so very, very much. You know, I've been looking forward for uh, to this interview for a very, very long time and, and getting to get, uh, having more information about the Cupcake Girls and, and, and what you do. So I am extremely excited and very thankful to have you both here this uh, this uh, afternoon, I guess, is where we are. So uh, anything that the intersection can do to to assist uh, Cupcake Girls, please let us know. Uh, you know, obviously, if you have any kind of literature that you want us to uh, disseminate, we can do that. But also, you know, keep us in mind in terms of your partners being one of the partners, because we would very, very much like to remain involved. Uh, Margaret, thank you so much for conducting this outstanding interview. Uh, can't wait to meet you in person, <laughs> both of you actually in person. Uh, welcome to UNLV, and thank you so, both so very, very much for, for doing this interview. Thank yes. you so much, uh, Dr. Barlow. I appreciate the opportunity, and it was wonderful, to, so wonderful to learn more about uh, Cupcake Girls. And, and I just want to echo Dr. Barlow when I say, please, please think of the, you know, the Jean Edich Women's Center as a partner and reach out, and um, we'll do everything we can to support you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to share, and thank you for the support on behalf of myself, our organization, our clients. Really appreciate that. Oh, and one quick.